Thank you. It's a wonderful occasion to be here. I'm very happy and honored that I was invited to speak to you today. So I'll speak to you about a value-based world order. Humanity's central task for the 21st century is the achievement of a value-based global order jointly endorsed and upheld by the leading societies and cultures of our world. In this lecture, I will explain what this means, why it's important, and how we might achieve it. The value-based order is first and foremost one in which conflicting claims are not settled through violence or the threat thereof, and in which economic strength also plays a much diminished role. We find many models of such an order in the most advanced national societies of the present age, in Northern and Central Europe and Canada, for example, and also to a lesser extent in India, Australia, the US, and the rest of Europe. <coughs> None of these societies are anywhere near perfect, but they are all in their progressive efforts guided by the same three key normative ideas, which are very suitable also for guiding the evolution of our emerging global institutional order. <clears throat> the first of these key normative ideas is rule of law, which has at least the following basic elements. The interactions of agents are regulated by a body of recognized clear <coughs> laws laying down in advance what each participant is entitled, permitted, forbidden, and required to do. These laws include upstream procedures for making and modifying law, as well as downstream procedures for its interpretation, adjudication, and enforcement. The law, as authoritatively interpreted, is complete so that agents do not have conduct options whose deontic status, entitled, permitted, forbidden, or required, is left indeterminate. And laws are consistent so that whatever any one participant is entitled or required to do, no other participant is permitted to prevent her from doing. One might add as a somewhat more controversial further element that there is to be a division of powers separating the officials in charge of formulating the laws, the legislative branch, from those in charge of interpreting the laws, the judicial branch, and both of these from the officials in charge of implementing the laws, the executive branch. Now, while the rule of law gives human agents protected domains of external freedom, it does not ensure that these domains are minimally adequate to the needs and dignity of human persons, nor does it preclude excessive disparities. These two gaps are filled by the remaining two key normative ideas. The second key idea is the safeguarding of every human being's basic freedoms. This idea has five basic elements. The legal system is to be designed so that all its participants securely enjoy freedom from violence as well as from threats and fear of violence, from slavery, coercion, intimidation, harassment, and duress. The legal system is to be designed so that all its human participants securely enjoy freedom from deprivation, have secure access to adequate food, water, shelter, sanitation, electricity, clothing, human interaction, education, and health care. It is to be designed so that all its human participants securely enjoy by themselves or in community with others liberty of conscience, freedom of religion, freedom of expression, freedom of association and assembly, access to human knowledge, debates, and cultural productions, and freedom to petition political authorities. It is to be designed so that all its human participants securely enjoy the freedom to direct their own lives and activities that they can choose their place of residence and profession, marry and found a family, travel, own personal property. And finally, the legal system is to be designed so that all its adult participants can play a constructive role in shaping and revising its rules and procedures, 
have the opportunity for input into the design of the legal system that governs their lives and interactions with others. So that's the second key normative idea. The third one is that there must be significant limits to the inequalities that the legal system establishes or engenders. The specification of this idea is somewhat more disputed, but I think we can safely posit three main elements. First, the legal system must not discriminate by assigning different rights or privileges to people on the basis of such factors as gender, skin color, caste, sexual orientation, religion, values or political beliefs. Second, all participants in the legal system must have roughly equal opportunities to influence political decisions about its design. <coughs> and third, any design decisions about the legal system ought to take equal account of the needs and interests of all its participants which might be stated more precisely in terms of Pete Dalton. In the choice between two candidate legal design options, D1 and D2, if the representative groups that would do better with a decision in favor of D1 are larger, worse off, and also more strongly affected by the outcome than the representative groups that would do better with a decision in favor of D2, then D1, D1 is to be chosen over D2. So these three egalitarian elements are to ensure that income and wealth, as well as education and employment opportunities, are widely distributed and that there will consequently be no small elite influential enough to capture or corrupt the political system. <coughs> Now, looking at the real national societies today, we are struck by the severity of their shortfalls from this idea. All national societies are, for example, far more unequal than could possibly be justified by reference to the equally weighted needs and interests of their members. India is a case in point. The richest 1% of India's population now capture 22% of its national income, while the entire poorer half must make do with less than 15%. This sort of inequality is far larger than could plausibly be justified by the need for economic incentives for the sake of stimulating progress and innovation for all. Now looking at the most advanced existing national societies, we should also be struck however, by how well they are doing in maintaining a value-based legal order unperturbed by changes in the distribution of interests and power among their members. This success is largely due, I believe, to a little noted normative innovation that with some local variations has emerged in several cultures around the world. This normative innovation concerns the way we are educated to organize our loyalties and attachments. Human beings are social animals, and our ties to others are fundamental to our identity. Among these are first and foremost our ties to our next of kin, parents, spouses, children, siblings, then ties to friends and neighbors, colleagues, partners, fellow members of our religion or caste, from earliest historical times, human beings have lived in networks of such associations, have had to set priorities among them to balance them against one another so as to do justice to them all. The modern state is one more association for its members, demanding their loyalty alongside all the others. And we know that it often successfully demands quite a lot of loyalty. Millions have marched to their deaths on its command, often in preference to saving themselves and their families. But what is even more remarkable is that the modern state often successfully demands that we completely set aside all other loyalties in certain contexts, 
set them aside as if they did not exist at all. This is an amazing civilizational breakthrough, perhaps the greatest civilizational breakthrough in all of human history. To see this, consider that human beings form very close bonds with one another. The bond between lovers, or between parent and child, for example. And it's extremely natural for people who stand in such a very close relationship to give it a lot of special weight. For a mother, say, greatly to prioritize her child over other people to whom she has a much slighter attachment or none at all. It is truly astonishing, then, that our ruling morality strictly limits the scope of any such partiality. There are certain contexts in which a mother must not give, even to very important interests of her child, any special weight at all. When she acts as principal of a high school, for instance, submitting pupils' grades to colleges and universities, it would be wrong of her and widely condemned if she gave greater weight to her own child's very important interest in admission than to the analogous interest of other pupils. Another paradigm example of this is a government official who participates in a decision about awarding a government contract or filling a government position. Even if one of the competitors is her own son, She's expected completely to disregard this fact, to use it not even as a tiebreaker, but rather to decide impartially or else to recuse herself from the decision. Her loyalty to the state is expected not merely to outweigh or to trump, but rather to annul and to cancel her other reasons for action. A mother may prioritize her son over all others as much as she likes in her personal life. But in matters of state, in her role as public official, she must treat him like a stranger, or so our modern morality commands. You will be quick to say that we are far from realizing this ideal of the impartial official, and right you are, for India and nearly for every other state. But this is our ideal, and those who are found to have violated it are branded as corrupt and nepotistic and hounded from office. Not only public officials deal with matters of state. We all do when we exercise our office of citizen, when we weigh in on how the legal order of our society ought to be structured. Suppose a citizen takes a position on whether the dearth of women engineers should be remedied by instituting special quotas and scholarships for female high school graduates willing to pursue a career in engineering. Suppose she publicly opposes all such measures and reveals in an interview that her opposition is motivated by the fact that her own children are boys who stand to lose twice through the expense of the special measures and also through the increased female competition that these measures would engender. Supporters and opponents of the measure alike would criticize her for being improperly influenced by her private attachments. In matters of state, she ought to be guided solely by what, in her conscientious judgment, promotes justice and the common good, <coughs> leaving out of account the particular needs and interests of herself and her near and dear. I've highlighted two features of the modern state. Its organizational aspiration, as summed up in the three key normative ideas of rule of law, basic freedoms and equality, and its innovative demand for a special loyalty that within a certain limited range of issues cancels even our otherwise deepest <coughs> personal loyalties and attachments. These two features are, I believe, closely connected. It is because and insofar as the state is seen as the guardian of impartiality 
that it can, can claim title to the special loyalty it demands. The state's rules, procedures, and other institutional arrangements are not living accountable creatures who could be expected to conform themselves to the society's normative aspiration. Rather, their character and effects depend on the human agents who formulate, shape, design, interpret, apply, enforce, obey, violate, undermine, or ignore these rules. This is why we all, as officials and as citizens, have a responsibility single-mindedly to uphold the justice of our society's legal order. Insofar as we give weight in matters of state to our own personal interests and loyalties, the legal order will be distorted in favor of its stronger members. A distortion that, of course, we find to a greater or lesser extent in all existing societies. But the ideal is clear nonetheless. As a human being, I inevitably care disproportionately for my family, my friends, my neighbors, and the fellow members of my other communities. And yet, I am to want these special people, and also myself, to flourish only in the context of a wider social world that gives fair opportunities to all. This structure of desires is analogous to that in the ideal athlete who, however passionately she may want to win, wants to win only in the context of a fair competition. Such a noble athlete cares nothing about any title and fame she might gain from a victory that has been fixed in her favor in advance by bribing the umpire or by poisoning the opponent's food. Our deep and not yet fully conscious moral aspiration is to be like this athlete. We do seek success for ourselves and our near and dear, but only insofar as we can attain it on a level playing field where all others also have fair opportunities to flourish. We do not, or at least are not supposed to, value titles, honors, and advancements insofar as these derive from advantages to be enjoyed unjustly. To achieve a value-based world order, we will need to transpose to the supranational plane not merely the key normative ideas, but also the little noted normative innovation I've been discussing. We need to establish an ethos of impartial loyalty to humanity, a cosmopolitan loyalty that cancels all other loyalties within its special domain of global governance. We find some concrete materials for such a cosmopolitan loyalty in the oath of office of the UN Secretary General, which commits this person and surrounding staff to a certain impartiality under the UN Charter. And we also have some impressive documents that express the first two of our three key normative ideas, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the two human rights covenants, and other human rights documents, and a few other treaties. These documents can be viewed as jus cogens, as expressing basic principles of justice, that are valid regardless of states' approval. And remarkably, this is exactly how states themselves present them to us, as articulating internationally recognized and inalienable human rights, that is, as human rights that exist apart from their legal recognition and that cannot be waived, forfeited, or taken away. Most of international law, however, is viewed as a negotiated bargain reflecting the ever-changing distribution of national interests and bargaining powers. Especially in regard to, broadly speaking, economic rules, states do not see themselves as pursuing justice or fairness or some common good, but rather the economic advantage of their respective domestic populations or, more likely, elites. Accordingly, 
international agencies, international agreements, and the negotiations leading up to them are pervaded by national partialities. We see this in organs like the UN Security Council and the UN General Assembly, where delegates display only a minimal rhetorical commitment to the UN Charter, other international law, global justice, and the common good. It is widely expected and accepted that even most international officials, members of the WTO appellate body, for example, and even judges at the International Court of Justice, give disproportionate weight to the interests of their own country and its governing elites. In the context of such wide acceptance, these persons do in fact often and blatantly favor their own country in ways that would be met with near unanimous condemnation at the national level. <coughs> national governments consequently expend considerable efforts on filling important such positions with a compatriot. Consider the extreme length to which the U.S. government regularly goes to ensure that the president of the World Bank will be one of their own. This effort stands in stark contrast to the quite negligible effort that the government and citizen of Texas expend toward ensuring that the U.S. president will be a Texan. The difference cannot be explained by the greater power and influence of the president of the World Bank, on the contrary. Rather, the difference is primarily explained by the fact that state officials and citizens throughout the U.S. know that the president of the United States will not and politically could not substantially favor the interests of his or her home state, whereas government officials and individuals around the world well understand that the president of the World Bank will run the bank to promote U.S. economic and political interests and U.S. ideological <coughs> commitments, and that such conduct will be expected and accepted by the global elites and replicated by other intergovernmental officials and national governments. I see this as a hugely important frontier in humanity's struggle for progress, even survival. At present, global political decision-making is not even remotely inspired by an impartiality requirement analogous to anti-nepotism. In fact, the supranational analog of nepotism is so widely taken for granted that there isn't even a word for it. The dominant view is that those involved in the creation, revision, or application of international rules are permitted, even encouraged, robustly to advance the interests of their home country. This dominant view is tolerant of national partiality even in regard to the formulation, interpretation, and enforcement of international rules and in regard to the daily operation of intergovernmental agencies and organizations. States view most supranational rules not as serious moral constraints upon their competitive efforts, but rather as themselves part of the game, instruments in the pursuit of the power they crave in order to advance their own particular interests and values. For this reason, international relations are often described as a jungle. None of the rules that states have adopted provides any lasting protection because states are known to abrogate or renegotiate these rules as they please. Consequently, no state is secure against the spiral of descending power and status. As its military and economic power declines, the state will be compelled to accept less favorable terms of cooperation by other states. This will further weaken its military and economic power. States enjoy no ultimate protection against even the very worst outcomes, and history knows many societies that were annihilated <coughs> through physical destruction or forcible incorporation into others. In international relations, might makes right is still the highest norm. Governments may pay lip service to the goal of realizing the three normative ideas worldwide, to be sure but they also make clear that they cannot honor these ideas so long as they lack any assurances that other states are honoring them as well. 
How can we break out of this catch-22 situation? How can we get to a world where national and international politicians and officials, <coughs> as well as the world's citizens, have a genuine moral allegiance to the justice of supranational rules, as well as the procedures for their creation and revision, plus also arrangements for the interpretation, adjudication, and enforcement. Intellectually, this task seems achievable. National impartiality requirements are now deeply entrenched <coughs> in the more advanced national societies. Anti-nepotism has a long and distinguished tradition in several great cultural traditions, as well as much more recent, but also inspiringly passionate support elsewhere. In South Korea, Malaysia, Brazil, and South Africa recently, for example. So the idea of a special kind of loyalty that cancels other loyalties within its domain is already familiar. It should thus be possible to gain a foothold for this idea on the supranational plan, for the idea that it is as shameful to subvert the justice of our global institutional order for the benefit of one's own country, as it is to subvert the justice of one's country's national legal order for the sake of benefiting oneself and one's family and friends. While the task thus seems intellectually within reach, politically it is daunting. One reason for this is that the needed transition cannot count on an important factor that may well have played a crucial role in the emergence of the modern state. I stressed how remarkable it is that in many national societies, an impartiality requirement associated with certain roles and performances has come to be internalized and honored to the extent that it is. How remarkable it is that in these societies, most citizens are genuinely disgusted when they learn that a mother has used her political office to enrich her son, even when this gain is greater than the social loss. Centuries of social struggle on different continents and in diverse cultures have preceded this civilizational breakthrough. Crucially important to the historical outcome is the plain fact that in any historical period, societies that were ahead in terms of internalizing a strong impartiality requirement had a substantial competitive advantage over societies that were behind. By interfering with an efficient merit-based <coughs> of labor, nepotism and other forms of corruption are a serious drag on any society's ability to solve its problems and to compete against other societies. Now, national nepotism is certainly a huge drag on humanity's ability to solve its problems. Witness the problem of advanced weapons and other dangerous technologies, the threats of ecological catastrophe, resource depletion, financial meltdowns, and so on. But unfortunately, this drag causes no competitive pressure. We are not falling behind some other intelligent species, at least not as far as we know. And the real prospect of future catastrophe does not seem sufficient to instigate the transition to a cosmopolitan ethos. That this is so reveals another reason for why the task is politically so daunting. Achievement of a value-based world order would make military might largely irrelevant and would reduce the significance of economic might as well, since supranational rulemaking would come to be based on an equal concern for the needs and interests of all human beings. Such a shift would substantially reduce the importance of states whose current power derives very largely from their military might which are first and foremost the US, Russia, Pakistan, Israel, and North Korea. Still beholden to the traditional conception of international relations as a jungle, these states, and especially their governing elites, will be most inclined to prevent the needed transition in order to preserve their power and standing. 
Unfortunately, they are likely to succeed for the simple reason that international tensions, hostilities, and crises, which perpetuate distrust and keep the frightful image of the international jungle vividly before us, are much easier to trigger than to preempt or avert. Under all its diverse presidents, the US is forever deploying its mighty military in many places around the world, not because such costly deployments solve any real problems or even bring specific benefits to the US, but primarily just to keep the world mindful of the importance of military might in regard to which the US is the world champion. While enhancing the political power of the United States, this posture also reduces humanity's chances for survival. We are unlikely to solve the world's existential challenges so long as states must assign highest priority to the imperative of maximizing their power in order to protect their basic interests and values from one another's hostility. And yet, the transition is morally necessary and probably necessary even for humanity's very survival long term. Our task, therefore, is to join forces in order to make this transition politically less unlikely. Doing so involves formulating and advocating a plausible global impartiality requirement that demands individuals to put aside their personal and national partialities in a special range of contexts where they, as individuals or in some official role or in behalf of a state or enterprise, contribute to the formulation, interpretation, or implementation of supranational rules and procedures. In such contexts, their overriding concern ought to be that these rules and practices collectively accord with the three key ideas of just and fair rule-governed cooperation. This requirement is strong and extensive enough to ensure that if most of us came to honor it and came to demand that their national leaders honor it as well, then the ensemble of supranational institutional arrangements would have the requisite impartiality, organizing a genuine cosmopolis in which countries, enterprises, and individuals can safely cooperate and compete on a level playing field. Thank you.